you just sang. Pour it out, demands my life, my soul, my all. You know, I've been reflecting on these messages and lest you think they're just for you, I want you to know who gets preached to first. As I've been reflecting on these messages, I, I think what strikes me is my prayer needs to be Lord, don't ever let me forget what you've done for me. Don't let me take for granted that I'm saved and just, you know, skip through the tulips. Don't let me be sad about what you've done, but Lord, don't ever let me forget. Continually remind me of why I stand righteous before you. Because of your willingness on my behalf. We talked about that last week. If for those who have the, the bulletin insert, you'll probably notice a mistake if you haven't. The scripture is right. The title of the message is wrong. I forgot to change it. It should read the infliction on the innocent. From Matthew 26, 47 through 27, actually 32 this morning. So as we begin, you can turn to Matthew. I'm going to go there in a minute. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 47. But as we begin, let me ask you some questions. What's your tolerance for pain and physical abuse? Well, if you're like me, it's not very high. <laughs> Which means if this were me going through what Jesus went through, I'd have, called, I'd have, you know, I'd have yelled uncle long before Jesus did. And he didn't. What's your uh, tolerance for pain and physical abuse? Then let me ask you some questions upon that. What would you be willing to go through physically for yourself? What torture would you be willing to put up with for you? Okay, then let's extend it out. What would you be willing to go through for someone else? Right? Then what would you be willing to go through physically for your enemies? Then add to that thought, would you be willing to go through it if you knew you were completely innocent? Luke 23. You don't have to necessarily turn there, but Luke 23, 22 through 25. Basically, the scenario is Jesus is before Pilate. And basically, what Jesus says um, in Luke 23 in verse 22, he said to them the third time, because they're yelling, crucify him. And he says, what evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death. Completely innocent. And what interesting is during this time when they would have been inspecting him, kind of before these trials, and inspecting him when he says, I found him innocent. Do you know at the very same time, the paschal lamb would have been before the chief priest and the high priest, and they would have been expecting him to declare the paschal lamb for the Passover innocent. Do you think that's irony at all? That Jesus, who was the lamb of God, was being inspected by those, and those who were inspecting him said, he is innocent. Hear the, hear the words from Romans chapter 5. Verses 6 through 8. What would you be willing to go through for your enemies, particularly knowing you are completely innocent? Romans 5 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The scenario in verses six, five, six, 7 and 8 is, well, maybe if you were good. Eh, righteous, you wouldn't need it. But we're none of those. We are, verse 8, Christ died for the ungodly while we were still helpless. And what's funny about that particular verse in Romans is 
without Christ, when would there ever be a time when we weren't helpless and sinful? If it were not for the incredible mercy of God, you and I, brothers and sisters, would be left in our sins waiting for the judgment of God in his perfect holiness. And yet, what was Jesus willing to do on our behalf? And I want to I wanna accentuate the physical today for a reason. Not to, not to get gross, not to, to, to make you feel bad. But hopefully that when you walk away from this message today, you will feel in the depths of your spirit a sense of gratefulness for the physical torture and abuse that Jesus put up with and that's before he ever had to experience God's wrath, which we'll talk about in two weeks. So let me, let me turn us to Matthew chapter 26. We'll start in verse 47. I want to I read the text first to get a feel for what's going on. And then I want to go back and highlight portions of the text. I'm not going to expound on the whole text today, but just to highlight portions of it. So picking up where we left off last week in Matthew 26, in 47 through 68, we read this. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he was betraying him. He gave this sign saying, whoever I kiss, he's the one, seize him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, hail rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you have come for. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who was with Jesus reached and drew out his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I can appeal to my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? How then will the scripture be fulfilled, which say that it must happen this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come with me with swords and clubs to arrest me, as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas and the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. They did not find any, even that many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, This man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to him, Do you not answer? What are these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I assure you by the living God, you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, thereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have heard him. You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and beat him with their fists and others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is the one who hit you? Now jumping ahead to verse 27, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now when morning came, this is all the evening before, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. Jumping down to verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor questioned him saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? 
And he did not answer him with regard to a single charge, so the governor was quite amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any prisoner that, whom they wanted. And at that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For they knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife said to, sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man or that innocent man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what shall I do with who, he who is called Christ? They said, crucify him. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. Then Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting. He took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took him into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took a scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to crucify him. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, who they pressed into service to bear his cross. What was Jesus willing to go, go through to suffer physically for our salvation? Well, I want to start you before the cross. In verses 47 to 50, they seized him and bound him. Why? Why, he says to them, I taught in, your, in the temple and you didn't arrest me. You didn't seize me then. Now, I'm just going to say this. When they seized him and bound him, they weren't treating him very kindly. They would have had bound him in chains. They would have been dragging him already in a physical weakened state from where he was in the garden. Right? We've already seen some of the physical stuff he would have been experiencing. So they seize him and they bind him. Verse 65 and 68, as he's standing before the chief priest, and later on in 27, 30, they spit on him. Have you ever been spit on before? Have you ever seen scenes in a movie or a TV show where they spit in people's face out of disgust? Right? And you say, well, how much could he be hurt by the spit? It's the shame of the spitting. I mean, I've, one time I think in my life I've had somebody spit in my face and I was so disgusted. It was like somebody else's saliva touching my body. So they spit on him. Then they struck him, I, this is amazing, they struck him with fists and with the staff, with the reed, again and again and again. They would have hit him continually, beat him with this rod on his head. My goodness. What was the question I asked? What would you be willing to do for your enemies, even if you're innocent? Everywhere in this text indicates that Jesus was innocent. He was a righteous man. And this is what blows me away. I think this is why I struggle with, with this even year after year. You just want to jump up in the middle of this story and you want to grab him and pull him aside and say, leave him alone. He was innocent. He was righteous. Do you feel that way for Jesus? Do you just want to jump in and, and like rescue him? And yet here's the reality. Here's the paradox. The only way he could do what he was about to do is because he was innocent. God's incredible paradox that the innocent would suffer for whom? The guilty. You and I, the guilty. So they're striking him. And, and you've got to think about, at this point, the soldiers are probably beating him to the point where his, 
you know, he's unrecognizable. He's going, by the time he ends up on the cross, you, you, you just wonder who is he, right? And then they slapped him. It says in, in verses 65 through 68, they slapped him. Now, this is interesting. They didn't just do a little slap on the cheek like that. Now, think about the context. The context is to humiliate him, right? To, to, to cause him to suffer and to humiliate him. Do you know how they would slap people? They'd slap them up. They'd cuff them up with the right hand on the back of their cheek. Then they would bring it back and they would slap across. That's why Jesus earlier in Matthew says what? When your enemies slap you on the cheek, do what? Give them the other cheek. What was Jesus doing? He was practicing what he preached. He gave him his cheek. He slapped him hard probably multiple times slapping him back and forth while he's bound. Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, the innocent one, was willing to take that and he was willing to practice what he preached. Give him the other cheek. Wow. Then they scourged him. This is where it gets interesting. Let me share with you, and I quoted, I quoted last week from this book, Died He for Me, and there's a lot of really good stuff in here. But I'm, I'm also going to quote from Chuck Swindoll a lot, The Darkness and the Dawn. It was a book he wrote where he, he just outlined what happened at the cross. So let me quote from these two sources what was going on during the scourging. And I, I just love this. I don't know if you caught it. He's innocent. We'll scourge him, then we'll let him go. <laughs> Even if they don't send him to the cross, church. What they did to him during the scourging would have been absolutely incredible. Listen to what Swindoll says. He says, in Roman scourging, there were no specific, specific, specified numbers of times a, vic a victim could be beaten. Now, in Jewish law, you couldn't, you couldn't scourge somebody, you couldn't flog somebody more than 39 times. It was against Jewish law. But you know what? Whose law were they under? Roman law. Right? So... So it wasn't like you got to stop at 39. These guys would keep going. It says, understandably then, the Romans commonly called their torturous act of scourging halfway death. Before the scourging began, the victim was stripped of all of his clothing, possibly being completely naked at this point. Can you imagine that? And bent forward over a low, thick stump or post. At the base of the post were four metal rings. The wrists and ankles of the victim were shackled to these rings. Jesus was stripped of his garments, bent low over this post, wrists and ankles shackled in that position. Talk about being vulnerable. The scourging was done by a man called a lictor, a professional in the grim art of torture. These guys who, who scourged and who crucified were professionals. They did it well. They knew what they were doing. This was not some half-hearted person doing it. They did it well to their perfection. The instruments uh, used in scourging was a flagellum. It was a piece of wood, 14 to 18 inches long, circular in shape to which was attached long leather thongs. Into these leather thongs or straps were sewn bits of glass, bone, and metal, pieces of metal. Scourging was designed to reduce the naked body to strips of raw flesh and the inflamed, bleeding wounds. It was not uncommon for a man to die on the stump. Right? It wasn't uncommon. But the goal was not to kill them. Can you imagine that? These guys were so precise that they could scourge these people, these criminals without killing them before they send them to the cross. I don't know how. I don't know how. I'd have been gone long before Jesus was. Invariably, the victim passed out from pain only to be revived by being splashed with buckets of salt water. Can you imagine that? Buckets of salt water on these open wounds. The torturers laid pain upon pain to the victim to keep the victim conscious, wanting him to suffer as much as possible. The one in charge of this torture kept watch, so they had somebody watching. It was his responsibility to stop the discipline if he thought the guilty one might not be revived. And he says in this book, the goal was not to kill him. The goal was to inflict as much possible pain before they sent him to the cross. Wow, that is absolutely interesting. 
And Swindoll says this, it's easy to forget that Jesus was tortured, brutalized, and mistreated for an extended period of time before he was led to the place of the execution. Physical effects that would have resulted from the scourging. Now I want you to think about this. It would, Swindoll doesn't say it here, but I have learned in the past that the way it was done, it, was, it would come around their back, it would hit them, and it would come around, and it would tear into their abdomen. So all of their flesh was being torn back. So it's very possible that at, before Jesus even ends up going to the cross, that he's disemboweled. Okay. Yeah, that's disgusting, right? Yeah, that's a TMI, Pastor. But do you realize what Jesus went through? Some of the things he would have been dealing with, shock from extensive physical trauma he endured, shaking and shivering following. I mean, can you imagine what your, bo what your body does to get ready for the next blow? You're getting struck and they're pulling the, the flagellum back and your body is like tensing up and shivering and shaking, getting ready to defend itself against the next blow. Swollen. I mean, he would have been swollen. His features probably would have been undistinguishable. Then, then, in 27, 27 to 31, they strip him and reclothe him. Now think about that. They take his clothes off and they put other clothes back on. What does that do to the skin? It's clinging to this raw skin. It's being yanked and pulled every time they do that. I mean, this is just amazing. Then, I love this, they shoved crowns of thorn on his head. Okay, they would have had these thorns lying around. Usually they had them, they were cut, uh, and they were three and a half inches long. Now picture with me, three and a half inches long. Okay, as they put him, they shoved it on his head. The, the indication is they didn't place it. They would have shoved it. Why? Because they wanted maximum pain and maximum torture. Shoved these thorns into his head. It would have gone into his scalp, possibly touching even his skull. Right? And it's interesting because as I was reading this book, this doctor said something really interesting. Why the crown of thorns? What was the punishment for Adam after his sin? That from the ground there'll be thorns and thistles. I never had made the connection before. Is the thorns that Jesus is experiencing in his skull connected any way back to the consequence that Adam would have received in the garden? Wow, I'm just like, incredible. And you know what I think is interesting? We heard it in the text, and I want to share this. 1 Peter 2.23. I just want to share Jesus' response. And being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. According to scripture, and do we believe it's true? According to God's word, not once did he ever whine and complain and cry. Not once did he ever say, this isn't fair. but he entrusted himself to the one who judges righteously. Church, do you get it? Do you understand? The only time he spoke according to the Gospels is when he had to. When he was adjured by the high priest. You had to answer when the high priest adjured you by the living God. He had no choice and he was God. He understood that. And they said, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And what's interesting, he's never said, yeah. He said, yeah, as you say it as I am. You're the one that's saying I'm the Messiah. And yet look at what you're doing to me. Never once did he utter back or cry out. He took it. 
took it. Why? Because Romans 5, 8 says, while we were, God demonstrated his own love in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Why did he do it? There's only one reason. Because he loved us. And I don't believe Jesus could stand to watch us be separated from him knowing that he could do something about it. That's love, folks. That's love. Then it gets worse on the way to the cross. So if you go to 27, 32, on the way to the cross, as they were coming out, they found a man of Simon, a Cyrene named Simon. They pressed him in his service to bear his cross. Why? Because he would have staggered with the cross beam on his shoulders. The weight of the cross beam carried in a week. Now think about this. The state he's in at this point, and in the book, Died He For Me, the author says this. He says, by the time Jesus would have been finished with the scourging, he would have been what we call today in modern terminology in critical condition, and he should have been hooked up to life support. By the end of the scourging, he was in an incredibly weakened state, probably almost unconscious near death. So he staggers. It's, it's understandable, right? The weight of the cross beam, it says, it, Swindoll says this, in strictly physical terms, he would not have carried the entire cross. Okay? We, we see movies about them carrying the entire cross. That is absolutely a, a misinterpretation. It's a miscalculation. That's not the way it happened. No man carried the, the two heavy timbers that formed the entire cross. The eight, foot, the eight foot six by six piece of rugged timber plus a cross beam would have been too heavy. The victim did, however, carry the cross beam of his own cross, right? Which was burden enough. The beam was hoisted across his shoulders and chained to him or roped to him. Then around his neck was hung a board about 12 by 24 inches, which was written his crime. Okay, what was Jesus' crime? <laughs> it was the Messiah. That was his crime. Right? And then he succumbed, not only staggered with it, but he would have succumbed under the weight of the cross beam. So unable to carry the cross beam any further, Jesus had been tortured and beaten so badly that he stumbled under the weight of the cross beam, unable to go on. The beam was simply too heavy for him to carry. When we remember that Jesus had been awake all night, now think about this, he, he'd been awake all night, absolutely exhausted, under the emotional strain of six or seven totally illegal trials against him. Right? The Jews broke their own law to crucify him. Who was guilty in all of this? It wasn't Jesus. He was the innocent one. They were the guilty ones, and the scripture tells us that they were envious of him. <laughs> right? His own people, his own religious leaders were envious of him. He'd been awake all night, scourged and abused by the soldiers. We can conclude he was exhausted. That's Warren Wiersbe quoted in Chuck Swindoll's book. Mark 15, 22 suggests by the word they brought to Jesus, the idea is, the literal transmission means to bring someone to carry the cross for you. So you've got that on the way to the cross. Then we're at the cross now. In 2731b, it says, after they mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put on his own garments back him, and they led him away to crucify him. You've got the spikes in his wrists and feet. Now listen to what Swindoll says. The executioner laid the cross beam behind Jesus and brought him to the ground quickly by grasping his arm and pulling him backward. As soon as Jesus fell, so, so he's falling onto the cross beam backwards in the state that he's in. I don't know about you, I couldn't have fallen there in good physical shape. Falling back, right? And he's probably, we've seen it depicted in movies, falling back and just slamming against the ground, right? Um, as soon as Jesus fell, the beam was fitted under the back of his neck and on either side. Soldiers quickly knelt on the inside of the elbows. 
So they've got him down, and they're kneeling on his elbows like this, with his arms back. Once begun, the matter was done quickly and efficiently. The executioner wore an apron with pockets. He placed two five-inch nails between his teeth. Now, Swindoll says five. This guy says five to seven. Now, fi figure that one out for me. How these spikes are this long, okay? These are like railroad spikes, like mini railroad spikes, not your average size nail, house nails, right? Okay, so they take that, they place those nails between his teeth and hammer in his hand. He knelt beside the right arm. The soldier whose knee rested on in the inside of the elbow held the forearm flat to the board. With his right hand, he probed the wrist of Jesus to find the little hollow spot where there was no vital artery or vein. So he's got to find it so he doesn't spill out all his blood, right? because they don't want him to die too early. When he found it, he took one of the square cut iron nails from his teeth and held it against the spot directly behind where the so-called lifeline ends. Then he raised the hammer over the nail head and brought it down with force. The executioner jumps across the body to the other rest. As soon as he was satisfied that the condemned man could not struggle in struggling, pull himself loose, and perhaps fall forward from the cross, he brought both of his arms up rapidly. This was the signal to lift the crossbeam. So they're going to lift the cross, they're going to nail them to that, they're going to lift the crossbeam. Two soldiers grab each side of the crossbeam and lift it. As they pulled up, they dragged Jesus by the wrists. Okay, he's already got these. By the way, it depicted he was, he was nailed in his hands. Well, why is that physically impossible? Because it would have ripped. They had to put it in a place where it would have been sturdy to hold to the cross, right? So he grabs this. As they pulled up, they dragged him by the wrist. When the soldiers reached the upright, the four of them began to lift the crossbeam higher until Jesus' feet were off the ground. The body must have writhed with pain. When the crossbeam was firm, set firmly, the execution, so they would have dropped it into the ground, set the board, which listed the name of the prisoner in the crime. Then he knelt before the cross. Two soldiers hurried to help, and each one of them to hold a leg at the calf. The ritual was to nail the right foot over the left. This was probably the most difficult part of the work. If the feet were pulled, to, pulled downward and nailed close to the foot of the cross, the prisoner died quickly. They didn't want him dying quickly. Over the years, the Romans learned to push the feet upward on the cross so that the condemned man could lean on the nails so as to stretch himself upward. See, they wanted him to not die too quickly. They wanted it in position so that he would die a painful, long death. Wow. Then we get suffocation, right, in 31b. He would have been lifting himself up. On the cross. Some historians describe the saddle like piece of wood on the upright pole where the victim could rest the base of his pelvis and find relief. You see that, right? It's almost kind of like a little seat that you see depicted. His arms were now in a V position, and Jesus became conscious of two unendurable circumstances. The first, that the pain in his wrist was beyond bearing, and the muscles cramped, knotted his forearms and upper arms in the pad of his shoulder, right? The second was that his pectoral muscles at the sides of his chest were momentarily paralyzed. This included in him voluntary panic, where he found that he could draw air into his lungs. He was powerless to exhale. So he could draw breath in, but it was incredibly difficult to get rid of it. Can you imagine the pain as he's lifting himself? Then there's the scraping that would have gone on. Now think about his body already in the state that it's in. Right? He, his body, his flesh would have been torn at his back as he pushed up to get air. To be able to keep breathing, the victim on the cross had to stay in constant motion. Now think about that, constant motion. We've got it depicted as Jesus kind of resting there, right? It would have been constant motion, constant motion to get that breath that he couldn't fully get, which means that he would have been rubbing against that cross constantly up and down. Wow. Wow. And so literally, he dragged himself up and down constantly so as to make breathing possible. Eventually, he could no longer lift himself sufficiently to continue breathing. Now, understand that. And he also would have been experiencing stuff like, in the heat of the day, he was, he was crucified in the morning from 9 to 3. 
there would have been the sun, the heat of that eastern sun coming down, beating down on him, possibly stroke. And then again, I've already talked about the shock. Now, I want you to think about this as we get ready to close this message out. It was slow, drawn out, shameful, as humiliating as possible, and suffering as painful as possible. The purpose of Roman's crucifixion was to punish the criminal in a way to be excruciatingly painful, humiliating, and a lingering death. And I think God was merciful. You know why I believe God was merciful? Because it, I read it could take up to 72 hours to die once on the cross. Think about the pain leading up to that. That's just 72 hours, right? That they could have been on the cross. But it's interesting that he died when he did. He could have died on a Monday. Right? And it could have gone on for 72 hours. He died when? He died on Passover. Which means that they would have to break the legs of the men because they couldn't have, according to Leviticus, it would have been unclean to have those dead men on the cross at Passover. So that they, they came to break the legs. But what was cool is, Jesus only suffered once on the cross for six hours. As much as he went through, that was God's incredible mercy for Jesus. That he didn't have to experience it longer than he did. I want to just read to you, as we close out today, Psalm 22. Isaiah 53 clearly points to the cross. Isaiah 22, or Psalm 22 is a messianic psalm. Yes, it's David writing it, but it's prophetic. And I just want you to think about, reflect on what the scripture says about what happened to Jesus. Verse 14 says, I am poured out like water and all my joints are out of joint. <laughs> I mean, ask a medical guy. What his hands and arms would have been like. They would have been cramped, right? They would have been like, can you imagine that? Right? The Bible says it predicts it. Right? His joints are, I mean, and you, you see Jesus depicted is kind of twisted, right? He's not upright like this. He's twisted. His body is contorted from all the things he's experiencing. Then, my heart is like wax. It's welted, melted within me. Can you imagine the stress that would have been on Jesus' heart in all of this? Just amazing. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. My tongue cleaves to my jaw. Boy, why do you think his tongue is cleaving to his jaw? Absolute dehydration. That's why at one point they offer him drink, but he doesn't take it. He doesn't even take the painkiller. Think about that. I was thinking about, you know, we were talking about children being born the other night. And I marvel at the fact that my wife was able to go through five childbirths with absolutely no medication. I mean, women are probably shaking their head going, wow, that's a strong woman. Think about what Lisa was able to experience with that no med. Can you imagine what Jesus went through with no medication? Nothing to numb the pain. He rejected that painkiller that they would have given him. And finally, at the end, he only drinks out of his own volition. When he was ready to give up his spirit, he then is willing to do that. And you lay me in the dust of the earth. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare, they can count all my bones. Why? <laughs> Think about what his body would have looked like. A church, why do I bring this message to you this morning? Because I don't want us to forget. I want us to understand. I want us to appreciate what Jesus went through 
in a minute, we're going to sing a song as we close out the service. I really want to worship you, my Lord. What should our response be to what Jesus was willing to go through for me? Now think about this with me for a minute. Think about the physical suffering he experienced, and you go, that was horrific. Right? He, he dealt with God's wrath. We don't have to because think about it. For those who reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, what kind of physical suffering will they go through and for how long? It'll be for all eternity. And I don't know if you know this church, but everybody, believers and unbelievers, will be resurrected to life. They'll be resurrected and given brand new bodies. Believers will be given resurrected bodies to be able to endure or to be able to enjoy, should I say, salvation with God in heaven. Unbelievers will be resurrected, I believe, right before the judgment. And they will be condemned to eternity in hell under God's wrath for rejecting the only offer of salvation that Jesus was willing to give on the cross they will endure eternally, probably to some degree, what Jesus endured on the cross for three hours for our salvation. Let's pray. Father, we really do want to worship you. We thank you, Jesus, for what you were willing to go through, not only the agony in the garden, but the willingness to go through the physical pain that I, I, I know I did a, uh, an okay job explaining, but Lord, we could never truly understand the suffering that you experienced on our behalf. And Lord, anybody in their right mind would look and say, why in the world would an innocent one go through that? Well, it's because he had to for us, because he loved us, because we were guilty. And so, Lord, what should our response be? Nobody should have to drag worship out of us as believers. We should willingly, we should just, just excitedly want to worship you because of what you've done for us. Father God, as we come to sing, would you stir our souls? Would you once again remind us what you experienced on our behalf? And as John 10, 18 says, nobody took your life. Nobody made you do this. You were crushed by the Father. The Father pleased to crush you, but you willingly accepted it because of the outcome of it. And that would be salvation for those who would believe in the perfect sacrifice, in the perfect Lamb of God. And so, Father, we really, really, really want to worship you this morning. Not with our lips, not with our heads, but Lord, we want to worship you with our soul, with our whole being this morning as a way of saying thank you, thank you, thank you once again for what you did for us. Lord, would you find our worship acceptable? And Lord, not only would we worship you in song this morning, but we would worship you with our lives. We would worship you by wanting, shouting it to the world this is what my Jesus did for me. And this is what he did for you. If you would just believe, you could receive this beautiful salvation and eternal life. So Lord, may our worship be pleasing to you this morning with our lips and even with our lives. We ask it in Jesus' precious name.